Jobs Committee. Special shout out to our Madam Deputy Mayor Shockley is in the house. Uh, city family, friends, neighbors, uh, and my colleagues, Nithya Raman, Marquise Harris Dawson, uh, soon to be joined by uh, Paul Kikorian and Bob Blumenfeld. But I think we have a, a quorum. Yes, we do. Mr. Clerk, Clerk would you do the honors, please? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, first off, for attendance, uh, Councilmember Price. Here. Councilmember Krikorian. Councilmember Blumenfield. Councilmember Rahman. Here. And Councilmember Harris Dawson. Present. I think we've been joined by Mr. Blumenfield. Yes, Blumenfield present. Okay, very good. Okay, uh, members, we have uh, six items on today's agenda. I'm going to recommend that items three, five, six will be moved on consent. But before we do that, we have the pleasure of uh, public comment. And so, uh, Mr. Clerk, would you please tell us how we accomplish that, please? Yes. Members of the public who would like to offer comment, public comment on the items listed on the agenda should call 1-669-254-5252 and use meeting ID number 160-177-1578 and then press the pound key. Press the pound key again when prompted for participant ID. Once admitted into the meeting, press star 9 to request to speak. All right, thank you. Who is our first speaker? To speak in public comment, please press star nine. If the callers would like to speak for public comment, please press star nine. Callers to speak for public comment, press star nine. Caller, please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Caller, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, can I get your name and no. the items you'd like to speak on? Yes, um, I would like to speak on item four. Okay, you have a minute, you may start. Thank you. My name is Brenda Martinez, and I am a board member of the Boyle Heights Neighborhood Council. I also chair the Transportation and Environmental Committee, and I sit on the Planning and Land Use Committee. I support the work on the legacy businesses of Boyle Heights Community Partners and Little Tokyo Services. And today I would like to speak on behalf of that item um, with regards to our businesses that are not franchised and affiliated with any national or corporate chain. Um, businesses that are being in our community. Um, Boyle Heights is a very old community, it's a historic community that has businesses that have been here for over 60 years. So I would like uh, for our committee to consider those issues, um, helping uh, small businesses contribute to overall cultural identity in our neighborhood, stabilizing funds for expanded property tax reductions, um, just supporting those uh, community businesses and we'll love to work uh, with, our, with this committee. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Next. Callers, I would like to speak to the committee. Press star nine for public comment. Mr. Chair, no one else is requesting to speak. Okay, then we'll, uh, we'll close. Uh, public comment. Uh, and before we go any further, let me just acknowledge our own grand dame, Olivia Mitchell, is in the house. Madam Mitchell, always a pleasure. Thank you, ma'am, for joining us today. Okay, we're going to, uh, I'm going to move uh, members that we take items uh, three uh, relating to uh, the minimum wage annual increase, item five relating to the Century City bid, and item six the Greater South Park bid on consent. Is there 
any discussion or any concerns or any objections to that action being taken? All right, seeing none, those items will go on consent. Mr. Clerk, what is next on our agenda? Okay, very good. Okay, uh, that would bring us to... We can't hear you. Up, oh, excuse me. That would bring us to uh, item number one. CAO report and communication from the mayor relative to acceptance of a grant award in the amount of $53,249,641 for the Office of the Governor's California Volunteers for Youth Employment Program. This matter was also referred to the Arts, Parks, Health, Education, Neighborhoods Committee earlier today and was approved by that committee. All right. Well, $53.3 million grant is nothing to, uh, nothing to sneeze at. Uh, EWDD is in the house. What's all this? What is all of this about? Council member, may I speak on behalf of the mayor's office? Yes, yes, you may, Madam, Madam Mayor. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, to the other council members, uh, thank you for having me this afternoon. My name is Brenda Shockley. I am the, is something, is that my feedback? Or no? Okay. My name is Brenda Shockley. I'm Deputy Mayor for Economic Opportunity and Chief Equity Officer for the city. Uh, I'm really excited to come here today because uh, it's an opportunity to share what we have found to be um, a wonderful opportunity for youth in the city of Los Angeles. And when I say youth, I mean those up to age 30. The Californians for All Youth Workforce Program is a $148 million governor's initiative administered by California volunteers in partnership with 13 cities across California. The award for each of the 13 cities is a formula calculation based on total city population. The city of Los Angeles' award is $53 million for a two-year period ending June 2024. The purpose of the initiative is to increase youth employment, develop youth interest and experience towards a career, and our office worked closely with five key departments. Representatives from those departments are present today. The Economic and Workforce Development Department, Board of Public Works, Recreational and Parks Department, and the new Community Investment for Families and Youth Development Department. And we are to develop program design that will serve approximately 4,000 youth over the two-year period. The city's application with its proposed program design was submitted in December, and the state's California volunteers approved the city's program design on March 1st of 2022. The California for All program requires participating cities to recruit, train, and place high-need youth at jobs in a new or existing youth force development program. The project list is in the report before you. It includes pilot programs that were funded with one-time funds in the current fiscal year, such as Clean LA, Angelino Corps, and Student to Student Success, as well as new ideas to help strengthen the city's capacity to address key areas of climate, food insecurity, and local COVID-19 recovery, such as LA River Rangers and expanded food distribution at family source centers. The California for All program will bring together youth across the city to help address urgent challenges in their communities while simultaneously learning key skills and earning money to help create career pathways. In short, this is a wonderful opportunity for career exploration and youth employment in the city of Los Angeles. EWDD's Assistant General Manager, Gerardo Brubacalva, as well as representatives from each of the implementing departments and I are available to respond to any questions from the committee. Thank you for having us today. Thank you, Madam Vice Mayor. This is, is an exciting uh, uh, development. Congratulations. 
I'm just excited that we see such collaboration and cooperation with, within the departments. This is really an exciting uh, thing, Omen, uh, and an opportunity to really focus on our youth and, and young people. I think we go up to thir age 30, I think you said. But when do we expect this money to be dispersed uh, and all, all the departments ready to roll or? Yes, in fact, um Oh my gosh, it's hard to believe today is just Tuesday. As yesterday, there meeting there were meetings on the platform itself on how we're going to document because we're certain that this is the beginning of other funding given certainly given the um, extreme reserves we have at the state. It's an opportunity to to demonstrate that not only can we provide meaningful programs, but we can do so expeditiously. Uh, all the departments are ready to go. We actually have been approved and uh, we are working our way through our own city process. Um, met at two o'clock with the uh, arts and parks and cultural um, committee. We're here today and we're hoping to get approval and move as soon as possible to full uh, presentation before city council. We really very much want to get, this is a two year program. The money goes away if it's not spent and we want to be on top of it. We want to uh, measure, keep the data, be ready to get more money, but show and demonstrate we can spend this money and spend it responsibly and on behalf of our most needy young people. How, uh, how will we address uh, equity issues in this. And there's a lot of money, a lot of organizations, a lot of uh, separate programs. Uh, any, any discussion, any thought, any, any consideration of, of how we uh, make sure there's an equitable sort of distribution yes. allocation? Yes, and first, some credit should be given, must be given to California volunteers because in the um, requirements and the eligibility for this grant, no more than 25% of the funds can be used to employ young people who either have one, a minimum of two barriers. One, they may have dropped out of school, they may be from a community that needs, um, that has been already identified as a, a community that has um, the level of poverty that meets the federal requirements, um, as well as those who are foster youth, those who have been in the justice system, and we also expanded to make sure we included uh, young people with disabilities uh, and other barriers. So that part is built in, and then on top of that, working uh, with the departments uh, using um, racial equity in city government as a guidepost, we make certain that uh, our outreach, and I think perhaps someone from EDD can talk about the platform that we're using, but that we have an outreach that meets not only the state requirements, but goes further and reaches out to those youth who have not been involved in the youth source centers or maybe not been involved in after school programs. Those disconnected youth that are so critical to a full complement of young people. It's encouraging to know. Talk a, bit, a little bit more, Mr. Rubicaba, about the disconnect or, or disconnected citizens. Well, youth. well, actually, we have higher LA's youth, and last year's or this year's uh, justice budget really focused a lot. We have the student to student programs, we have the Angelino Corps. And this was an opportunity to expand those programs and continue them because that was just one-time funding. So this was like a true uh, blessing that in a year when we would not probably be very competitive to get expansion, that we are able to get these dollars that are targeted and earmarked for the population of youth, particularly those as well as the young adults, such as those who are in our uh, LA Rise and other programs that are focused on returning citizens that are in, uh, within those uh, age groups, as well as foster youth, uh, youth that have uh, mental health challenges, 
um, that the expectation is that we engage those who have not been engaged in the past. We continue to serve the thousands of youth that know about the system, but this is an opportunity to reach out and target those who haven't had the encouragement or haven't had the support or actually don't know enough about it. So we're also going to be strengthening our presence in terms of the um, online uh, website and dashboard and using social media and all the things it takes to catch the attention of young people. We're also working, all of these programs are collaborative. They're collaborative within the departments and they're collaborative among the departments. Because in EWDD, we're also working with the higher LA use platform that we've always had, but we're augmenting it and enhancing it by also having uh, older youth in the families, tutoring the younger youth, being paid for it, Angelino Core, where you ha and, and in turn, really introducing so many of the young people to careers in education that in the past has never really been, really been encouraged the way I think it should be. Uh, we also are collaborating around the three issues that are really critical, the COVID recovery, trying to look at how can we have placements and jobs that will help the youth, help themselves and help their families. We're working with the community college uh, district so that ultimately we will also have those older youth who still need assistance themselves getting assistance from the College Promise students who are part of College Promise Works. So we really have quite a network of uh, opportunities and programs, like I said, within certain departments, multiple programs, and then among uh, the various departments, like the Clean LA and the LA River Rangers. But also the other part that really uh, pinpoints where the state wants to go is around food insecurity, is around climate, and around COVID recovery. It was lost, the loss, uh, education loss in the last three years is immeasurable. And we are really using this as a way, not only to just provide experience and exposure, but also to try to close those gaps and provide the support and leverage, if you will, that's needed in order to help close the gaps. Okay, great. Let, let, let me just acknowledge uh, our, our colleague, uh, Paul Kikorian, uh and, and our budget chair. Uh, let me just ask one question. I'll, I'll ask the members who uh, they have any. How big was the total pot? I know you said we got to 53 million, which was monumental. I'm just curious, how big was the total pot? Do you know, do we know? The total pot was 148 million. Okay, well, that's not so bad then. We did pretty good. By population, we should have. Yep, absolutely. Members, any questions, thoughts, comments? Okay, seeing that, I'm going to move that we approve the uh, CAO report recommendations. And I and ask, uh, Madam uh, Deputy Mayor, that you come back maybe every quarter. Just sort of give us an update. I know this is a Certainly. two year program, but we'd love for you to come back and let's get a progress report how we're doing, you know, how many agencies are engaged, how many youth are in involved, and, and kind of what the status of these, these programs are uh, as, they, as they move forward. So, yes, uh, we definitely. Mr. Clerk, would you call the roll, please? Oh, yes. Council Member Price. Uh, this is to approve the CAO report recommendations. Aye. And that, uh, Council Member Krikorian? Aye. Council Member Blumenfield? Blumenfield, aye. Council Member Robin? Yes. And Council Member Harris Dawson? Yes. Very good. Okay. Thank you, members. Let's move on to item number two, Mr. Clerk. Item two, CAO and Joint Workforce Development Board, Economic and Workforce Development Department reports relative to modifying the Workforce Development Board year 22 annual plan for program year 2021-22. Good afternoon, okay. Mr. Chair, council members. How are you today? Uh, the CAO Good, report, you. my name is Jennifer Lopez. I'm from the office of the CAO. The CAO report before you recommends to accept the program year 21-22 Workforce Development Board carry-in report as transmitted by EWDD and the Workforce Development Board 
to expand prior year program year general fund dollars for workforce development programs and to negotiate and execute agreements and or contract amendments for those programs. These actions enable EWDD to utilize prior year savings and to adjust the current year Workforce Development Board annual plan. As savings have been identified as EWDD and the Workforce Development Board have already closed out program year 2021. Um, our report also provides the controller instructions to implement these changes and we recommend approval as requested by EWDD and the Workforce Development Board. And as reported, just to give you a summary, EWDD and the Workforce Development Board um, recommended funding change results, which, which, which results, excuse me, in a net increase of 297,000 overall that rolls over into 21-22. This is composed of $4.3 million in carryover savings from the WIOA fund in the amount of 2.8 million and prior year general fund saving allocation savings in the amount of 1.2 million, which is offset by a decrease in revenues totaling 4.3 million. This is composed of 5 million in anticipated revenue that we expected from the Build Back Better legislation, which is yet to be approved in Washington, and the receipt of an additional 1.6 million in CARES Act funding. Um, this report recommends reprogramming 1.2 million in general fund, which is composed of 91,000 in day laborer centers, 88,000 in higher, LA, higher LA, 102,000 from LA Rise, 939,000 in summer youth employment, and 194,000 in the youth opportunity moment, movement. Um, just one note to add is that our fiscal impact statement should actually read 1.33 million. So just for the record, we'd like to correct that in our general fund revenue due to reduction in related cost reimbursement. Um, our office will continue to work with the department to identify general fund savings to mitigate this impact before year end. Um, we would recommend that the council and the committee approve the CAO recommendations. I am joined here by EWDD. Um, Carolyn is here and as well as Gerardo. Thank you. Yes, Madam, uh, Madam General Manager, any, uh, any comments uh, before we have any questions? Well, first of all, it's a pleasure to, to see all of you council members and thank you for having us. I just want to say a, a few brief uh, words about the Carrion Report. Uh, as the city begins to recover and rebuild, integrating the workforce development system with innovative economic development initiatives is a critical priority for our collective work to implement equitable strategies that support growing industries and increase the prosperity of the residents for the city of Los Angeles. As you know, the department over the last several months has launched numerous programs, including the comeback checks, the $25 million comeback checks program. We've maintained services at our business source centers, our work source centers and youth source centers via a combination of virtual activities, telecommunication and limited in-place services. We've reimagined Higher LA's youth program. We've launched the Bears Equity Program. We've launched a new LA Rise Youth Academy. All of these have been successfully run, and I could go into other uh, initiatives, but really the Carrion Report presented today provides an opportunity to expand critical programming as we seek to re reconnect Angelinos to the workforce. Before I turn it over to my colleague Gerardo, I want to highlight new programs that I'm very excited to announce today. The Los Angeles Small Business Corp is a new initiative that will connect community college, community college students studying business administration with small businesses through a 300-hour internship. This will not only provide youth with real-world experience in the private sector, it will also provide small businesses with much-needed support and technical assistance. Another program that I want to highlight is our Substance Abuse Disorder Counselor Pathway. EWDD proposes to allocate $300,000 to train 24 job seekers as substance abuse disorder counselors. The behavioral health field in California has a documented shortage of certified, uh, certified counselors caused by several factors, including the increased demand of substance abuse disorder services, and like in many other health industries, a high staff turnover and burnout, burnout rate. This program will implement a cohort training model that brings together the dis disparate entities involved in the certification process and to provide a cohesive pathway for individuals. Over an 18 month period, individuals will be able to obtain classroom and field experience necessary to meet the market demand. Another program that I'm really proud of is the apprenticeship program. 
EWDD proposes to allocate up to $200,000 to develop a virtual internship portal. The Workforce Development Board previously allocated $150,000 to LAUSD to develop the first phase of the apprenticeship portal. However, due to several factors, LAUSD can no longer lead the development of the portal. EWDD will now partner with the Mayor's Office of Innovation to implement the development of the portal. The funding will augment the Workforce Development Board's investment in the portal. Finally, the report also includes increased funding for employer engagement. The revised budget increases funding allocated to Los Angeles County Economic Development Corporation to support with employment engagement activities for all workforce programs. The goal of this funding is to better connect employers struggling to find employees with the work, struggling to find employees uh, with the workforce development system in order to increase placements for program participants. In summary, our carry-in report has an eye toward equity and all of our programs are dealt are, are fashioned in a sense to provide the most equitable distribution of, a resource, of our resources. I'll now turn it over to my colleague, Gerardo, for additional comments. Good afternoon, every, everyone. Um, again, Gerardo Rubalcaba, Assistant General Manager for Workforce Development. Um, I actually just want to request an amendment to our recommendations. Um, when, and this is related to the Substance Abuse Counselor Program. Uh, at the time that we proposed the program, we did not identify a service provider. Um, our intent was to conduct a procurement to identify uh, an eligible service provider. Um, since the program, uh, or since our transmittal has been released, we did identify a, a service provider, um, a partnership actually between the Coalition for Responsible Community Development and the Amity Foundation has actually secured funding through the state California Workforce Development Board. Um, and so we are proposing to allocate the $300,000 identified in this plan to the partnership between CRCD and Amity Foundation to expand the program rather than to develop competing programs. Um, so with that, I, um, you know, we can take any questions on, on the carry-in report. Really uh, appreciate the involvement of Amity. We know they've been very engaged in assisting those formerly incarcerated. And so frequently that's, uh, they, they've been, they, they get left out. And so I'm glad that we are intentionally including them. Uh, uh, Carolyn, you talked about three uh, exciting new programs uh, being implemented. Talk, talk a little bit more about the, uh, the college uh, students, how you intend to recruit, how they're gonna be placed and how that, how does that play out? And I can take that. Um, or Carolyn or, or Gerardo. Yes. Sure, with the LA Small Business Corps, we intend to partner um, with the mayor's uh, College Promise Works uh, team as and our the city's business source center system. So currently through our LA College Promise Works program, we have youth source center staff co-located at each of the nine LA area community colleges. So through that team, we will begin to recruit um, eligible uh, um, business students that are interested in the 300 hour internship program, uh, they will be paired with a business source center that will then help place them with um, some of the small businesses that they are currently working with. Um, and, and the goal is to identify um, community college students that are in their second year of studies and have completed a certain number of credits in, in business administration. Uh, the report notes that the uh, the uh, that there'll be reduced reimbursements for related costs from the uh, WIOA fund in the amount of one point two million dollars. That's uh, a lot of cheddar. Are these reduced reimbursements to the general fund anticipated to cause a negative impact on on any of these programs? No, How are they they compensate. Um, th th there will not be a negative impact on um, any of the proposed programs. Um, and I think as we've presented to this committee in, in, in the past, th there is a limitation in, built into the WIOA program that does limit the amount of the grant allocation that we can spend on, um, on administrative costs. Um, so th this is a result of, of you know, again, the, the grant limitations that do not allow us to extend beyond that 10%. Members, any, any questions, any comments? 
this time? Mr. Blumenfeld. Well, just, yeah, just, and just, this is great. Just following up on the 10% issue. So the 10% has to be made up out of, if the admin costs are above the cap and it's not eating into the program, that means we're paying for it some other way? Well, we, th through the 10%, we are able to cover all direct costs. Uh, so this $1.3 million is the related cost um, component that the city would be required to pay into the general fund. So does, you know, again, it, it um, we within the 10% are able to pay for all salary costs, you know, and fringe benefits. It's the central services component of related costs that um, is impacted and we cannot uh, reimburse again due to the grant limitations. So that, I mean, so that, and that comes out of the general fund ultimately, right? That's correct. And, and this isn't just a problem with this grant. Um, you know, this is a problem we're having across the board with, you know, inflation being what it is and salary costs, et cetera, are, are increasing. So our admin costs increase, but the grants aren't increasing uh, proportionately is the problem, right? So we need to get the grant makers and including ourselves when we're issuing grants to recognize that uh, that the costs are, uh, you know, that, you know, it needs to 10%. If 10% is not enough, it means that the pie isn't big enough to cover the, the nut. Uh, but I mean, just, just eyes wide open. It does mean that we are spending more money out of our general fund to, right. to do this work, this important work, but uh, I, I don't see a way around it other than trying to get the, uh, the grants to better reflect the actual cost. Yeah, and, and if I can add that one of the unique aspects of the WIOA legislation is that um, not only does it limit administrative costs to 10%, but it also requires us to share that 10% with our service providers. Um, so the, the net actual amount available to the department is on, and to the city is only 6% of the entire grant. So that's you know an, another big contributing factor to that $1.3 million. Thank you. Council Woman uh, Robin, are your hand up? Okay. Yeah, I'm fine. Thank you. Appreciate all your okay. work on this. Any other uh, any other questions, comments, members? Okay, seeing none, I'm going to move that we approve the CAO report recommendations as amended by EWCD. Please call the roll. Uh, yes, Council Member Price. Aye. Council Member Krikorian. Aye. Council Member Blumenfield. Blumenfield, aye. Council Member Rahman. Yes. And Council Member Harris Dawson. Yes. Very good. Thank you, members. Thank you. For your support of uh, item, item number three. Let's move on to item, uh, I'm sorry, item two. Move on to item four, Mr. Clerk. Very good. Item number four, EWDD report relative to the establishment of a legacy business program in the city of Los Angeles. Well, members, this is uh, something that's been near and dear to my heart. I first proposed this back in the 2019, I think, with the, the help of, uh, of uh, member Kikorian. Uh, you know, and the idea is that it's an opportunity for us to recognize those businesses that have, that have really stayed the course, those that have been made a real contribution to the community in terms of services they provide, in terms of hiring, jobs they provided. You know, not just a couple of years, but for decades, for decades. And so it's just an opportunity to join uh, with other major cities around the world that recognize the unique intrinsic value of our, of our businesses that uh, have been able to, uh, able to survive. And let me just say our discussion today is just gonna be a discussion, not gonna take any action, I still, want to have an opportunity for some input, not only from business organizations, but from uh, other stakeholders as well. Uh, they may want to uh, give us some thoughts or ideas on this. But uh, let's ask uh, EWDD to provide us with an overview of this report and, uh, and what we can see for the future. Sure, well, thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Yes, the floor is yours. 
Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the Economic Development Jobs Committee. Uh, I'm Fred Jackson, EWDD Assistant General Manager, and joining me today are Ken Bernstein and Wilson Poon with the Planning Department. And we're, we're excited to finally come before you to give an overview of our analysis of Legacy Business Program in the City of San Francisco, as well as other cities and uh, recommendations to establish a Legacy Business Program in the City of LA. Um, as you stated, small businesses have operated for many decades across Los Angeles are critical to our local economy. Uh, legacy businesses are often the local anchors that entice nearby residents to shop, dine, or play in their neighborhood commercial districts, creating economic energy and pedestrian level vitality that spills over to nearby uh, businesses, other nearby businesses. The loss of legacy businesses is often the mark of gentrification. As residents are driven out of their longtime neighborhoods, so are the treasured businesses they serve. Leg legacy businesses are also represent an important component of a strategy to help close the persistent racial disparities in intergenerational wealth. Preserving and enhancing family-owned legacy businesses in minority communities provides an important source of intergenerational wealth transfer that can help close this gap. Legacy businesses that have, rot, that have relied upon person-to-person -person contact were particularly impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Many of these legacy businesses were closed for many weeks or months, often representing the first time these businesses have closed in many decades. And there are, have been other legacy businesses that unfortunately have permanently closed. Legacy, biz, legacy and small businesses share many of the same challenges, including but not limited to increasing competition, tightening profit, profit margins, rising labor costs, and increasing lease rates. Legacy business programs in other cities fit into the following general categories. One, promotion activities, assisting legacy businesses with creative vehicles to market and increase visibility and exposure of business to potential customers. Second, technical assistance to address operational and technical issues that a legacy business may encounter. And then a third category is financial assistance that provide access to financial opportunities and capital to help sustain and or grow their business. EWDD was requested to study the San Francisco Legacy Business Program as a model for Los Angeles. And in 2014, a report by the San Francisco City's Budget and Legislative Analyst Office showed the closure of small businesses had reached record numbers in San Francisco. Commercial rents in most neighborhoods had risen significantly. A San Francisco supervisor proposed legislation and a ballot proposition that would become the legacy business program. Uh, it was introduced in two phases. Phase one created a San Francisco legacy business registry and to be listed on the registry, businesses must be nominated by the mayor or a member of the Board of Supervisors, along with a determination by the Small Business Commission that a business had met the following criteria. First, the business had operated in San Francisco for 30 years or longer. Second, the business had contributed to the neighborhood's history and or the identity of a particular neighborhood or community. And then third, the business is committed to maintaining the physical features or traditions that define the business. Then in 2015, phase two asked San Francisco voters to create a legacy business historic preservation fund that provides grants to both legacy business owners and property owners who agree to extend their leases of legacy businesses for at least 10 years to receive grants up to $4.50 per square foot of space lease per year. And it was capped at 22,500 um, or 5,000 square feet. San Francisco created logos and branding um, and other materials for legacy businesses. They also um, worked with the San Francisco Small Business Development Center, which is similar to our business source centers to provide technical assistance. In to structure a legacy business program for the city of Los Angeles, we recommend that the city authorize the creation of a legacy business program within our department um, to be administered in partnership with the Department of Planning, City Planning, and its Office of Historic Resources. The legacy business program will be celebratory and not regulatory. Uh, it will identify and designate businesses uh, for the purpose of providing recognition, assistance, and guidance. 
EWDD will be the lead department in providing technical assistance and business assistance grants to legacy businesses. City planning will be the lead department in outreach marketing, the new program and administrating um, the selection of businesses to be included in cities on the city's legacy business registry. So at this time, I'll, I'll turn it over briefly to um, Ken Bernstein, my colleague in the city planning department to provide an overview of the legacy business designation and registry, as well as our intended efforts in the areas of community outreach and engagement and marketing. Thank you very much, Fred, and uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members. Ken Bernstein with City Planning Office of Historic Resources, and we're very pleased to be joining with EWDD today. Uh, EWDD is the lead entity in this new program to help make this a success. Uh, Fred did an excellent job sketching the San Francisco program models from other cities. Um, and we would point out that in San Francisco and other cities such as San Antonio, their legacy business programs have been a partnership between their economic development or small business office and their historic preservation office, uh, either freestanding or within a department of uh, planning in those cities. And I lead the Office of Historic Resources within city planning. So we've been working very closely with EWDD and uh, preparing this report, create, crafting a thoughtful response to uh, uh, Councilmember Price, Councilmember Krikorian's motion. Um, this work builds upon some significant work that we have done as an office over the last several years um, and, and the completion of Survey LA, our citywide historic resources survey project, which in part identified over 300 sites citywide that were considered significant to the commercial identity of a community in Los Angeles. So we believe that we have this base of information that can be a great starting point for uh, a legacy business registry, uh, coupled with additional outreach uh, in, in communities throughout the city, uh, marketing materials and other outreach to spread the word about this opportunity and to create a very straightforward, we hope, uh, and simple process for application uh, and a simple process for vetting those applications to the city. Um, we also believe that city planning's expertise and skill set uh, in community engagement and outreach will be critical to the success of the program and will help inform the development of a legacy business registry. Um, our Office of Historic Resources would vet those applications and bring the registry uh, applications uh, through our Cultural Heritage Commission as a first step and then on to the City Council. So the City Council would have a, a defined role in final approval of any business's inclusion in the registry. And I would point out as well that uh, this is an important complement to the work that we do to preserve the unique identity of our, of our local communities and a tool to help preserve cultural landmarks in the city. You know, we are working hard to ensure that our historic preservation programs really weave equity and diversity more fully uh, into our efforts and that we, we move beyond just a focus on brick and mortar preservation to think about all the aspects kind of the living heritage and intangible heritage in our communities. And this is an important part of that effort so that we're not only preserving buildings and the architecture uh, in our community, but the people and places that give life and meaning um, to our local communities and local um, and local districts around the city. So, um, you know, we really uh, look forward to working with EWDD and all of you to craft this program. We think that with the COVID pandemic uh, and uh, coming out of this period of stay-at-home orders and uh, economic uh, distress, that there's greater urgency than, than ever and that legacy businesses are more precarious than ever before. So it heightens the urgency to, um, to uh, move forward and create a a meaningful recognition and assistance program. And as Fred said, not additional regulations or uh, permit reviews, but uh, celebratory recognition and assistance programs to help uh, businesses and communities throughout the city. So I look forward to uh, working with all of you and happy to join with Fred in taking your questions. And then again, I just appreciate the collaboration between the two departments uh, in a way that really uh, enhances and uh, provides some real, real focus. Talk a little bit about uh, either of you. Talk a little bit about uh, again the the, the, uh, the menu of, uh, of of services that these selected businesses are going to receive, uh, and uh, and talk specifically about the council's role in uh, in identifying and in approving uh, businesses that will be a part of this program. So, uh, uh, 
So, so EWDD, we will have approximately $3.6 million in, um, um, in grants that we will support uh, up to approximately 245 businesses throughout the city. And so it is our funding goal to um, um, these assist are equal, in, equal, These are equal grant amounts or some, pro, some formula that will determine how much one is eligible for or what? Yeah, similar to previous uh, COVID recovery grant programs that we've administered, um we would we set a, a, a funding goal of and target of ten thousand dollars for those businesses with um, employees up to uh, up to five employees and for those businesses with six or more employees we would provide a grant of uh, twenty thousand um, dollars and so it is our goal to try and disperse to disperse that um, throughout the city um, and for each council district our goal is to provide a minimum of 10. Uh, grants per council district, um, and we would do an equitable, have an equitable lens as we have throughout all of our programs that we have administered, um, with uh, priority given to those businesses that have owners that are low moderate income and or located within a low mod uh, census tract, um, as well as other uh, the other criteria that's uh, we've been admit, uh, of ha have identified um, in terms of small businesses. With gross revenue below 1 million, um, and that have been identified with the Cal and Bio screen map um, for an equity purpose. Um, the second part of your question, I'm sorry. Well, well the two is, is uh, kind of the other menu of services that they're going to be receiving. But talk also about the actual selection. So what role will council offices have in identifying these 10 or selecting these 10 or What's our role? If I may jump in on the registry. So we are intending to create a simple application process for businesses to be included. And I should mention, as I didn't speak to it specifically, the proposed criteria for inclusion on the registry are, are fairly straightforward, very similar to San Francisco, uh, a business that has been in continuous operation for 30 years or more within the same community at a physical location open to the public, because there are many um, certainly home-based businesses that may not have a physical identity within a community. So 30 years or more within a physical location open to the public and that either uh, meets one of these two criteria, contributes significantly to its community's history or identity, or sustains and cultivates distinctive cultural traditions or practices. Um, we look forward to really partnering with council offices to help market the program, to spread the word about this opportunity. Um, far and wide to businesses that may meet that criteria, and as uh, Councilmember Price said, uh, have really endured for many decades within the within the community. Um, and uh, again, we'd be taking that initially th uh, through the uh, Cultural Heritage Commission for a first approval, but that recommendation would go on to the City Council, so the City Council would have the final say on uh, inclusion on the Legacy Business Registry. It would then qualify those businesses for the suite of services that EWD, EWDD would be providing. And what do we envision those suite of services being? Sure. So, in addition to the grants, uh, we would provide technical assistance. We would um, we're looking to engage a contractor to develop a curriculum that specifically is targeted toward legacy businesses. Uh, with such topics as successful succession planning as well as um, lease um, 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 assistance. Um, in addition to that, as um, Ken mentioned, marketing and community engagement, we'd also look to, um, to look uh, with our collective departments collaborating to identify additional funding sources to assist um, legacy businesses throughout the city. Um, we'd also um, Vendor procurement, um, work with city departments to identify and provide priority procurement opportunities for eligible legacy businesses, um, as well as through the city planning department, explore other land use incentives that may be offered uh, for legacy businesses as well. You're going to do all this for $5 million? <laughs> uh, uh, yes, sir. We will, we will do that. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, colleagues. Any, add, council any... member. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Would you say, Ken? I, I was just going to add, uh, council member, that uh, we've reached out to our counterparts in the other cities, including San Francisco and San Antonio. And I think one of the things that 
they underscored as well, the funding is nice. The, uh, you know, businesses, of course, need financial support in that way. That some of the intangible benefits of being included in this type of program really overrode even the, the financial benefits. Just the, the marketing, being able to put up a decal or sign that identifies this as part of a, a legacy business program citywide, that marketing value on a city website, in a storefront, uh, being able to promote it as a council office or, or collectively, you know, through the city family, that these are our legacy businesses that have uniqueness in our communities, that that has tremendous value above uh, even some of the financial value. Well, I, I agree. Uh, the identified programs in San Francisco, San Antonio, Seattle. I understand there are also some international cities that have similar programs. Is that true? That is true. Buenos Aires, Argentina certainly is one that uh, that comes to mind, uh, among other cities that have done this internationally. I think Paris. I think I read Paris. Paris. Mm -hmm. They have a similar kind of program. Okay, yeah. Well, I think succession planning is certainly is high on that list of, uh, should be high on that list of, of uh, services offered, services provided. You know, frequently our small, medium-sized, older businesses don't have a succession plan. You know, it's a real issue, a real challenge, I think, for the uh, city to at least offer some, some guidance in that area uh, to be helpful. Members, any, uh, any thoughts or comments? As I said, we're not taking any action today. We really want to get some full suite of uh, ideas, thoughts, suggestions, recommendations back on this, encouraging you to get the word out to your business communities uh, and others who, who have an interest uh, in promoting uh, uh, these businesses and these institutions in our communities. Mr. Uh, Krikorian. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your, your leadership on this. And Mr. Jackson and Mr. Bernstein, thank you for your, um, for your report. This, I, I'm really excited about this. And I think there's, um, this is going to be a very important step for a lot of small businesses uh, that really make up the fabric of Los Angeles. Um, and Ken, I think you're right that um, the intangible benefits are incredible. You know, especially if we work, for example, with LA tourism. So when we when they promote different neighborhoods in Los Angeles, you know, part of what they promote is shopping in in that neighborhood or dining in that neighborhood. And here are the legacy businesses that define this community. I, that's a huge, huge opportunity for them. A um, couple of uh, questions as as we're further developing this. I wonder if you gave. Uh, uh, any thought or if, if other cities have to uh, continuity of ownership, because, you know, very often these businesses are not just about the, the brick and the mortar. It's about who's running it. It's about that, you know, that character that everybody knows the, you know, the, the owner that always goes the extra mile for people in the neighborhood. It's, it's those sorts of intangible personal things rather than the, the name on the front window. Um, ha has anybody done anything uh, along those lines? Um, Ken, none that I have. Yeah, I, I think it's a great point, uh, yeah. Council Member. Uh, I don't know that uh, that that's been required necessarily as a prerequisite for the program. That there's been uh, complete continuity of ownership throughout the decades because businesses, ha you know, do change hands. Often they stay within the family, but at times they do change hands, and it could be difficult to uh, verify that just in terms of practicality of administration. But that's something we can look into more, uh, you know, based on that uh, that concern. And and it might be more a question of bonus points rather mm -hmm. than a I prerequisite. See. You know, mm -hmm. the Casa Vega, for example, in right. uh, this Ramen's district is is a place that you know it's just it's known it's connected with the family and yeah. um, it's not just about the food it's about the family and right. uh, there's a, a million uh, businesses like that the other thing is um, and again this is not about creating more barriers it's actually you know trying to open the door a little bit more I'm I wonder if rather than having a hard and fast 30 years in business prerequisite that if there's a way that you could do that as that's the presumption, but there might be exe exceptions to that in extraordinary circumstances where a business has been particularly impactful 
you know, in its first 20 or 25 years of business, for example. And, and I think that will actually open up the door for a lot more, um, a more diverse range of businesses as well. Um, that, you know, as Los Angeles has, you know, attracted more uh, immigrant families that are opening businesses, um, you know, there's a better opportunity for them to fully cooperate if we don't have a a really long period of time as a as a hard and fast prerequisite. But I did those are a couple of just off the top of my head suggestions that you know you might want to continue to look into. But I'm very excited about welcoming these uh, uh, this recognition for our legacy businesses. Thank, thank you, Paul. In fact, I share your enthusiasm as I said earlier, and I agree. I think uh, maybe a 20 year window would help us be even more inclusive uh, uh, as we uh, as we roll this program out. So let's, uh, I mean, that can be an amendment that we that we incorporate or change that we incorporate when we come back. Uh, we're going to continue this. I'd say for 45 days, just to give us enough time to get some get some more feedback. You know, we're going to be doing a budget next. Uh, for the next 30 days, certainly. Uh, but I think 45 days gives us a chance to, again, reach out to our business communities uh, and other stakeholders, uh, getting their suggestions, ideas, uh, and support for this kind of program. Any, uh, any objections to a continuance? Seeing none, we will continue this matter. Your hand's still up, Paul. Something else, or you just waving support? Okay, good. All right, well, this item will be continued for 45 days. Mr. Clerk, what else is before us at this time? Uh, that clears the desk, Mr. Chair. Well, seeing nothing else, ladies and gentlemen, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>